roots and radical expressions. So now we're going to try to, to find nth roots. So square roots, cube roots, fourth roots. It's going to be awesome. What we want to make sure we understand is how what all these little parts are called. So we have this root right here. And this value n, the nth root, that is called the index. So when we just have a square root, we don't actually write an index in there. But when we're taking the square root, the index is really 2. Okay, so then when we're taking a cube root, we'll see a 3 there and so on, right? Now we know that this check mark looking thing is called a radical, a radical sign, and then the value underneath it or the expression underneath it is called a radicand. Kind of a funny word. So let's try to find each real root. Okay, so square root of 121. I know it's a square root because I don't see an index there. That's just 11. We know that one by heart. So the cube root of 8. All right, this is our first cube root here. So I'm going to go ahead and write this as the cube root of 2 times 2 times 2 because I know 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. Well, I could write that as the cube root of 2 cubed. So do you see how my index matches the power on that two. So I know the cube root of two cubed, well, that's just two, right? All right, the fourth root of 81. Well, 81 is really nine times nine, but I want to look for four things. So nine times nine, that's three times three times three times three. So that's really three to the fourth. So the fourth root of three to the fourth would just be three. All right, the next one, the square root of negative 169. Be careful here. This is the square root of a negative. So what does that cause? An imaginary number. Well, this asks for the real root. It was specific, so there isn't a real root. So I'm just gonna say no real root. Now, if it was just asking me to take the root, what would the root of negative 169 be? 13i. Now in the next one, I have the cube root of a negative 125. Well, be careful here. Can I take the cube root of a negative and still have a real root? Do three negative numbers multiply to negative 125? Well, negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5 is still negative 125. So I can rewrite this as the cube root of negative 5 cubed. Well, the cube root of something cubed is just that number. So negative 5. No imaginary value needed. So it looks like if I take an even root of a negative number, I have no real root. I'm going to get an imaginary root. But if I'm taking the odd root of a negative number, I do have a real root and it's negative. All right, why don't you try 6, the fourth root of 256. All right, well, since I knew four cubed was 64, if I multiply that by four again, that's the 256. So the fourth root of four to the fourth is gonna be four. On this next one, I'm taking the cube root of 0 0.008. Well, we don't wanna use calculators here, so let's think about it. Let's just focus on the eight. The cube root of eight, well, we know that's two. So if I have one, two, three decimal places, and I'm gonna multiply three numbers to get that 0 0.008, well, 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2, that way I'm getting those three decimal places. So the cube root of 0.2 cubed is 0.2. Fourth root of a fraction? It's okay. We can just separate it. Fourth root of 16. Hmm. Two thirds. Okay, go for it. Nine and 10, maybe 11. All right, number nine, we see no real root because we're trying to take the even root of a negative number. No real root answer. Number 10, we have a fraction, and we already talked about that. So cube root of negative one over cube root of three. Cube root of a negative one is negative one over cube root of three. Well, there's no number times itself three times. Ugh. But do you remember that usually we don't leave radicals in the denominator? But this isn't just a square root. So if you've learned any shortcuts, slow down. Let's talk about this. I don't want to leave the cube root in my denominator. Well, is it enough to just multiply by the cube root of 3 over the cube root of 3, create a form of 1? No, that's not enough. Cube root of 3 squared doesn't help me. I actually need to have three threes to clear that cube root in the denominator. So what we want to do is make sure that these will match eventually. So if I multiply by the cube root of 3 squared over the cube root of 3 squared, now what happens? I have the cube root of 3 cubed now. That works. 
that was a lot and we're going to go much more into detail about rationalizing denominators with cube roots and others. I think we have the hang of it. Number 11, 1, number 12, negative 2. So we saw that anytime we have the nth root of something raised to the nth power, that they kind of undo each other. So we see for any real number a, the nth root of a to the n will equal, ooh, wait a second, a if n is odd and absolute value of a if n is even. Let's think about that. Why do we have to include that absolute value when n is even, when the index is even, square root, fourth root, sixth root? Well, let's just take a look at our example, square root of x squared. We know that the index is 2 here, and there, so n is 2, n is 2, so we'll just get x, right? The square root of x squared is x. Totally makes sense. No problem. Well, let's try that. What happens if I plug in negative 4 for x into this equivalent statement? I have said the square root of x squared is x. So it should be that all I have to do is plug in the same value for x and they should still be equal. Well, let's see if they are. Square root of negative 4 squared should equal what value for x? Negative 4. So I just plugged in negative 4 for x in both spaces. But here, negative 4 quantity squared, well, that's the square root of 16, but it says that it equals negative 4. No, it doesn't. That tells us that we needed the absolute value there. What happens when I put those absolute value bars on it because I have an even index? Well, now it's going to be a correct answer. Now I'll have square root of 16 equals 4. That's why when we have even roots, we need to put the absolute value on the variable to make sure it stays a true statement. So when I look at number one and it's the square root, I'm going to put absolute value right away so that I don't forget. Then I need to take that square root of 16x to the eighth. Just to walk us through it a little bit, remember we want things that are squared. So if I use that idea of close by multiply, x to the fourth squared is x to the eighth. And then I can clearly see that this would be the absolute value of 4x to the fourth. Now, we should be thinking absolute value bars here because it's an even index. However, as I look closer at what the simplified version is, four is already positive, so I don't need the absolute value around the four. And then x is raised to the fourth power. So even if x is a negative number, as soon as I raise it to the fourth power, it will become positive. So negative two times negative two would be positive four times negative two is negative eight times negative two is positive 16. So in this case, I do not have to have my final answer in absolute value bars, but I absolutely needed to think about it. Looking at number two, it's an odd index. Do I need the absolute value bars? No. I cannot worry about that for this one. So let's just go ahead and simplify this. So I broke this one down just a little bit different for you to consider it. Broke everything into cubes. Now, if I take the cube root of a cubed, I have a times cube root of a cubed, a, and so on. For a final answer of a squared b cubed, do I need the absolute value? No, because it was an odd index. Now I'm going to go ahead and get a little ahead of us here. Think about this. I ended up with a squared. I had an index of three and a power of six, and I ended up with two. Well, six divided by three is two. Would that work? Would power divided by root work? Well, let's see. b to the ninth and then the cube root of that. So nine divided by three is three. Yeah, it ended up working. All right, let's just make sure that this is consistently true. So we'll try it on the next one as well. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. It's an even root. I'm gonna throw those absolute value signs out there right now, because otherwise I might forget. Alrighty, so x times x times y times y times y. I bet you you realize I don't actually do it this way in the long run, but I'm still trying to get you to understand the concept. So we would end up with absolute value of x squared y cubed. And did that other thing work? Well, yeah, if I have 8 divided by 4, I do get x squared. And then 12 divided by 4, I get 3. That's just the quick way to get there. It's the same idea. Now, consider the absolute value sign. Do I need it around the x squared and the y cubed? Hmm, 
Mm -mm. Which one is not possible to get a negative answer from? Well, if you square anything, you're going to get positive. So the x squared does not need the absolute value symbol on it. So for my final answer, I'll have x squared times the absolute value of y cubed. Now you try. Let's check and see how you did. On four, you should get nine x squared. Now I didn't need those absolute value bars because nine's positive, x squared's guaranteed to be positive. Number five, I have a to the fourth, b to the fifth. Well, where'd that a to the fourth and b to the fifth come from? A to the 12th, then I take the cube root, so 12 divided by three, four, and then 15 divided by three, five. This last one, I've got the absolute value of x cubed, y to the fourth. Now, I didn't need both of those in the absolute value because y to the fourth is guaranteed to be positive. So I've just got the absolute value of x cubed and then my y to the fourth.